Assalamu alaikum. May peace be with you. I hope you're well. Today, uh, God willingly, inshallah, we are going to discuss the end of times. That is the time when the world is going to end and this has been prophesied in many religions. When it comes to Islam, there are some major and minor signs which have been prophesied by the Prophet about the end of times. So what are the signs and the happenings which will herald the end of of the planet earth and beginning of the hereafter a new life and some of them are quite controversial uh, like uh, for example the sun coming very close to the earth and we'll talk about that how scientifically that is possible that the sun could come close to the earth and yet uh, there still would be some life surviving on the planet and uh, the topic of our discussion today is surah 101 al qariya and this surah uh, goes in great depth to describe the changes which are going to happen at the end of times. So let's start with ayah number one. And ayah number one is just one word. It says, al qariya which means the sudden striking disaster. The word al qariya comes from the root word Qara. And the word Qara in Arabic means a sudden unexpected, disturbing sound, which is usually produced when one thing strikes against another. So it has also been uh, depicted as a rattling noise or a noise which is associated with disaster and destruction. Uh, For example, if you're traveling on a train and you are nodding off or fast asleep or just lost in thoughts and suddenly, God forbid, the train strikes some object like the train runs into another train, that loud, unexpected noise which would herald the disaster and shake everyone up would be known as qara. Among the Arabs, this was uh, quite a familiar term. Uh, If there was any uh, problem or a great disaster striking a tribe or a nation, the people would say, that they have been uh, struck by a great disaster. And in Surah Al-Raz, which is the 13th Surah, in Ayah number 31, Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا يَزَالُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا تُصِيبُهُمْ بِمَا صَنَعُوا قَارِعًا But as for those who are denying the truth, in result of their evil deeds, sudden calamities will always befall them. So the word al qariya or Qara'a is well known and synonymous with a disaster. The second ayah is composed of two words, mal qariya, which is a question form that says, what is the sudden striking disaster? And this is a natural question which would arise in any mind who hears the first ayah, because the first ayah is talking about a sudden disaster, which has been specified as a great calamity. But this is a very general term. In Arabic, it was used for any type of disaster and calamity. So the question arises, which calamity, what calamity are we talking about? And the third ayah further elaborates it. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَلْقَارِيَ And what will make you realize what the striking disaster is? And from here on in this surah, Allah is going to describe that event, that striking disaster, which is going to hit the planet before everything ends. In ayah number 4, Allah says, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ mabsus." It is the day people will be like scattered moths. Mabsus means to spread out, uh, to be scattered in a chaotic way. It comes from the word bassa, which means widespread. And farash is the Arabic word for moth. The pronunciation here is very important. If you say farash, it means a moth. But if you say firash with a zair under it, then that means a kite, you know, the flying kite. The paper versions which uh, kids or people fly for fun. So here it is farash, which means the moth. Ayah number five. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْإِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And the mountains will be like fluffy tufts 
of colorful wool. Now this raises a question. What kind of change can make people be scattered like moths and the mountains to become like colorful fluffy tufts of wool? We do know that mountains are made of different kind of rocks and minerals. Some mountains have iron ore in them, some have copper and some have silica in them. And all of these minerals have different colors. So if you were to destroy the mountains, they would come out in different colors. So what kind of forces can bring this about? And here we come to the ahadith, the sayings of the Prophet, which describes the major and minor signs uh, that would be preceding the final day of judgment. And in uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, Miqdad ibn al-Aswad, one of the Sahabas, he narrates from the Prophet that the Prophet said, On the day of Qayama, the end of time, the sun would draw so close to the people that they would be left only a distance of one mile. And he used the Arabic word meal, which means a mile. Uh, in fact, the English term mile is derived from the Arabic word meal. Now, this sounds quite amazing and unbelievable uh, because the sun, even if it would move halfway to earth, would completely destroy the earth by its heat. So how could the sun be only at a distance of one mile from the people on the Day of Judgment? And the answer lies in another saying of the Prophet. And this saying is from Sahih Muslim and also found in Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet says, that the hour will not come until the sun has risen from the west and when it rises and people see it, they will all believe. But that will be when it will do a person no good to believe. Now, how can the sun arise from the west? At present, we all know the sun arises from the east and the reason why the sun arises from the east is that the earth rotates anti-clockwise, counterclockwise and it rotates on its axis. Now, if and when this rotation reverses and the Earth starts to rotate clockwise, then the sun will appear to be rising from the west rather than the east. And the Muslim scholars, they have all agreed on it that this means a change in the axis and the rotation of the Earth. And this was well known to the Muslim scholars more than a thousand years ago. In the 11th century, Al-Biruni has said that, that Earth moves or rotates around its axis. And then in the 11th uh, century, uh, around the same time, Abu Sayyid al-Sijizi also has mentioned that. Tusi uh, has mentioned it in the 13th century. And in the 15th century, Kushji, another Muslim uh, scholar and scientist, he has mentioned that. So it was well known to the Muslim scholars and scientists that the earth rotates on its axis and they knew that uh, the axis is what makes it appear that the sun is rising from the east. Now if you rotate the earth in a clockwise direction, there's one more change which is going to happen. Due to the rotation of the earth, there is a magnetic field which is generated around the planet. And this magnetic field, it keeps the sun rays away from us. We only get very little amount of sun rays coming. The hazardous electromagnetic uh, rays, they are stopped by the magnetic field. So although the sun looks to be very far from us, but basically all the planets in the solar system, they are within the blazing glow of the sun, the intense radiation of the sun. The farther you get away from it, the less the radiation is. So Pluto is getting very little radiation. But Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Venus and Mercury, we are all within this outer zone of the sun with the blazing radiation. But that radiation is stopped by the electromagnetic field of the Earth, which is generated by rotation of the Earth in a counterclockwise direction. Once the rotation of the Earth reverses, this field will drop, this field will shrink. And the shrinkage of this field would bring those hazardous, intense radiation of the sun deeper into the Earth's atmosphere, which the Prophet had predicted that it would be only one mile away from the people. And this intense radiation 
and intense heat is going to have a devastating effect on the planet. It will destroy life on the planet and it will also destroy the big structures on the planet, structures like the mountains, which would start to disintegrate uh, under the effect of this immense heat and radiation. And I would recommend uh, that if you go on the YouTube and you look at the nuclear tests conducted by Pakistan in 1998, what they did was they diffused a nuclear device under a mountain in a tunnel. And you can see the mountain changing its color and powder rising from the mountain. So the stones and the soil of the mountain with the intense heat, they are coming up in a powdered form. And you can see the whole mountain is changing its configuration. And that's just a nuclear device. Imagine the nuclear radiation from the sun coming close to the depth of one mile from the surface of the earth. What devastating effect it would have. And this is exactly what Surah al qariya is describing. And after this ayah from ayah number six, the rhythm and the tone of the ayahs changes. So the first three ayahs were al qariya mal qariya wa ma adra mal qariya talking about the sudden striking disaster. The next two ayat they have a different rhyming system. So Mabsus and Manfush rhyme together. So this is a topic in itself, like a paragraph system of the Quran. And the Quranic paragraph system goes by the rhyming and the rhythm of the ayahs. And the next ayahs, you see the rhythm change. And anyone who has read the Quran and is familiar with the tone and the rhyme and the rhythm, they know that the topic has now shifted from that day of disaster to what is going to happen after that, the judgment day. So, فَأَمَّا مَنْ سَكُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ So, as for those whose scale is heavy, and if you go word by word, فَأَمَّا And as for those, man whose سَكُلَتْ means heavy, sakal comes from weight, so anything which carries a weight is known as sakal. Mawazinuhu is the plural, and it is a plural of two things. Number one is the plural for the word mawzun, which means anything with a weight, and mizan, which means a scale, like a weighing scale. And in Quran, whenever Allah is describing the Day of Judgment, Allah Ta'ala is often giving examples of the weighing scales, to weigh the deeds, the good deeds and the bad deeds. And uh, interestingly, even today we have this concept. When you uh, have a sign for justice, it's often the weighing scales. In some countries you have a woman standing with a weighing scale and she's known as a goddess of justice. In other, you just have the weighing scales as a sign of the court of justice. And in this ayah, Allah is talking about the people whose deeds would weigh heavy on the scales. Now, another very important concept in Islam is that good deeds have a weight and bad deeds or deeds which are done without a good intention carry no weight. So it is implied in this ayah when we talk about heavy weights that these are the weights of good deeds. So what happens to them? To the people who have got uh, heavy weights of deeds on the scales? فَهُوَ فِي رَاضِيَ they will be in a life of bliss. The word Isha comes from Aisha, and that means a blissful life with no worries. And Radia is one who is so pleased that is in a continuous state of contentment. So those people whose deeds are heavy, good deeds, they would be in a continuous state of contentment with a blissful life and no worries at all. And the next ayah gives the opposite situation. And as for those whose scale is light, they shall be in an abyss. This is a general translation. Now, the word used here is for ummuhu, and the second word used is havia. So let's talk about havia first. 
Havya comes from the word Hua, which means a very deep and a steep canyon. And when you say Havya, that means someone who has not just fallen in that in that canyon, but has been forcefully thrown. So there's a force which has pushed him, and there is gravity. Both of them are taking him fast, very fast, deep down into the canyon. Now coming to the first word for Ummuhu, this literally does not mean a, a, a board or a home or a destination. It means mother. In Arabic language, Umm is the word for mother. And when you say for Ummuhu Havya, literally this means his mother will be a deep or a steep canyon. And this is an interesting concept because in Islam, people are not just thrown in hell, they live in hell and hell embraces them like a mother does. So like a mother holds her child lovingly and protects it and doesn't let it go. Same is the case with hell. Let people who are sent to hell, they will be looked after and embraced by hell. And this is a major difference between Islam and other religions. In Islam, the concept of hell is that this is a place where people will live and they will have special bodies to adapt to that environment and live in it. It's not a comfortable living and their biggest pain would be regret that they could have been in heaven and yet they've ended up in this place and they have to spend the rest of eternity living in this awful place. And the next ayah asks the questions, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا here And what will make you realize what she is, which is referring to Havia. And the last ayah, ayah number 11, explains it, نَارٌ hamia, A blazing fire. Literally, hot fire. And here's the question. Everyone knows hell has fire. And everyone knows a fire is hot and it burns by heat. Why is Allah describing it here and why is Allah saying, Wama Adrakama here? What do you know that she is? What this Havia part of hell is? And the answer to this is that many people don't realize, according to Quran and Islam, hell is not only fire. There are parts of hell which are freezingly, bitterly, freezingly cold and there is a certain part of hell known as Zamharir, which means it's so cold that nothing moves in there. It's as cold as possible. In our uh, scientific terms, we call it absolute zero, minus 273 degrees centigrade, when all kind of motion, even subatomic level motion, stops. And medically speaking, there are two types of burns. One burning that happens due to fire and heat, and there's another burning which is very much similar, which happens due to exposure to cold, like frostbite. And this fact has been differentiated 1400 years ago in Quran by Allah, that parts of hell are so cold that they can cause a burning sensation and freezingly cold environment to live in, whereas other parts of hell are going to be scorchingly hot, which Havia is one of those parts and it's described here. What we have to understand is that what happens in life hereafter in heaven and hell can only be explained in metaphors and allegories, a metaphorical allegorical way to the humans, drawing parallel to the things in this world like cold and freeze and fire and hot. We cannot comprehend what heaven and hell are going to be like. For example, if you were to travel back in time a thousand years ago and try to explain to someone one thousand years ago what a smart mobile phone is and what a tablet is, you will have a big, big difficulty in getting the message across because they are not even familiar with the concept of electricity and uh, silicon chips and uh, of plastics and metal the types we use now like titanium and stuff. So it would be extremely difficult to explain to them what a tablet or a mobile is. And if they would take those words literally, mobile means something which moves. So they will think maybe it's something which is alive, which moves on its own. But it's not. 
it's actually a smartphone. Now, for someone living a thousand years ago, they don't even know what phone means. They know what smart means, but they don't know what phone means. And all of these things would be very confusing to them. So you can draw some examples and metaphors and allegories and explain to them that it's a device by which you can throw your voice from one place to another or a tablet is a device by which you can communicate and see things or take pictures and even record events and then replay them. But all of these things would be quite confusing for them. Similarly for us, knowing what heaven and hell is going to be like is beyond our comprehension. So a lot of examples are being given in Quran to draw a parallel and give us a general concept of what the life hereafter would be like. And one of the ways to understand the concept of heaven and hell by drawing parallels in this planet and this life is that we've got uh, many different kind of environments where life survives. For example, we've got uh, grasslands and savannas and forests where life uh, exists. And then we have these volcanoes, the edges of the volcanoes where the fire is pouring out or deep sea vents with boiling water and lava is coming out. And you have life forms living there. Now, of course, the life forms living near the sea vents or those living at the edges of the volcanoes are living in a very harsh environment. They've been given the capability of surviving there, but it's not a pleasant uh, survival. But they are blissfully unaware of the better land and of the better survival where animals can move around in the savannas, in the jungles, and birds can fly. They do not know of that beautiful, wonderful existence. So they have no regrets or no pains. They just live life as it is. But on the Day of Judgment, when people would be sent to heaven and hell, the ones in hell would know that they are living in a very harsh environment and they're living forever. Whereas their contemporaries are living in a much better environment and having a much more interesting life compared to them. And that pain and regret is one of the biggest punishments that would be for the people who have committed crimes against themselves and against other human beings or other creatures of God, what we call as a sin. And that would be the greatest punishment that they would receive. May Allah save us all from this kind of punishment and give us an eternal life with his blessings in heavens and in paradise. Amin summa amin. Please remember everyone in your prayers. And many thanks for all those who have made this effort possible, especially for Yasa Slim who's uploading them. And once again, a special request for people who are in ill health and are suffering from different health problems. May Allah grant them a speedy recovery and free them from the suffering of disease. Amin summa amin. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.